welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Uttinger and Brian Broom, and today we're talking about faith, community, and justification. Last week we were talking about apotheosis, the idea of man trying to become God. As the serpent said in the garden, you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. The pagan world has always been trying to ascend the ladder of being and uh, achieve godhood for mere mortals. Um, One of the ways they did that in the ancient city, I think we talked about this last week, was that the ancient city was a a religious institution founded on ancestor worship. As we look at the uh, the families, whether, whether we're in Canaan or whether we're in the Japhetic tribes that eventually would become Greece and Rome, and Egypt too, for that matter, We throughout the ancient world, we keep seeing this deification of one's dead ancestors. Basic worship was worship of basically grandpa, who's dead and buried in the back 40. And because he is, we own this land because we have to be near dead grandpa to feed him, to feed his spirit and keep him happy. Because if we don't, he will come back as a ghost <laughs> and terrorize us. This is not exactly a kind, loving relationship. This is a, um, the dead are scary. Mm-hmm. Something Thornton Wilder in our town could have told us. Um, <laughs> they don't get along with us living folks so well, but as long as we keep them happy, everything's okay. Well, what was, what was true on the family level also became true on the level of the city state of the polis. Can I just throw something in here? Yeah. You know, we were watching an anime the other night oh. that, was set in modern times. This is not exclusive to the ancient world. No. Before the meal, they took their little token uh, samples of food and put it in the family shrine. So this is for mom and grandma who had died. So it's not gone from the world, this idea. Well, we can think of also Coco. Mm-hmm. The, was a Disney film? Yeah. Yes, Disney. Study the ancient Greeks and walk and watch Coco, and it's like, okay, deja vu all over again. This is the same kind of thing. The ancestors need to be kept happy. On Coco, everything was kinder and, kinder and gentler. In the pagan world, not so much. Grandpa, if you, if you kept him happy, sure, he would try to do nice things for you, protect the home, be a guardian spirit, and so on. Uh, the, he gave. He was not an infinite deity. He could help you here and there with this and that, as long as you did that and this for him. But when we come to the city, we have the same kind of thing. The families look back to a common ancestor and lit a hearth fire to him. And then drew, in terms of that worship, they drew the sacred boundaries that would mark out the walls. Uh, And those walls were religious barriers. They kept out the aliens. They kept in uh, the true believers, the family. Us, as opposed to them. 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 And it was only, as I, I think I said at some point, it was only as the Greek city-states have found ancestors even further back that they were able to get along together to any degree. Because the Greek city-states spent a lot of time fighting. In addition, these, these city-states would also harness other deities into their service. Everybody saw the sun and the, the thunder clouds, and they watched the fertility cycle, and they, they would borrow these deities as well. Um, and in time, one city might look at another and say, hey, you have your own sky god, and we have a sky god. I wonder if it's the same sky god. We call him Zeus. Well, so do we. Yeah, and there the similarity completely ends, and we have to decide whether or not we have to hate <laughs> each other now because we're our religions don't match. It was true polytheism, a god for everything, but the central god was the god of the city who was an ancestor. And so as, as the city, like the family, tried to placate this God and keep this God happy, there was not a lot of love lost here in general. Uh, I'm, I'm sure we could find some myths and, and some ancient plays that speak of somebody actually liking the gods. But by and large, the gods were scary. Uh, there's the scene in Gilgamesh where uh, Gilgamesh is talking to Ishtar, and Ishtar's flirting, trying to seduce him. And he says basically... Um, yeah, that never goes well with, with for your lovers, does it? Now, how about this guy? What'd you turn him into? And then this guy, what what struck him? And then this, yeah, I don't think this is happening. And that made her very <laughs> angry. She ran off to her father God and said, he told me how slutty I am. <laughs> okay, well, 
And then she continued to do the same sorts of things. The, it was dangerous. And if you just read, as late as the Greek myths, you read the stories of anybody who Zeus set his lust upon. It did not go well with them. In in modern fiction, there's a there's a novel called American Gods. Oh yes, by Neil Gaiman, and it is very very similar. Even even so far to the it's dangerous to be lusted after by this Babylonian goddess, uh, a scene which became infamous for obvious inappropriate reasons, <laughs> is a goddess of sexual deviancy. It's just a cutaway. It it serves no purpose to the plot except to to show that these. These new gods are just as bad as the old gods and uh, will consume you in in the most literal sense. And thus magic becomes the barrier, the protection, the shield against the gods. The gods want everything done by the book. You have to perform their rituals exactly, word perfect, syllable perfect, intonation perfect, even if the words don't make any sense anymore. And and there's evidence of this in uh, the Egyptian papyri of... We, you say it like this, what does it mean? We don't know. Say it like this, because if you don't, bad things are going to happen. Irrationality bringing a rational predictability to a chaotic universe is an incredible thing. And, and, and back to the point I, I think I'm going to is no one wanted to befriend these gods. I mean, I'm sure there were exceptions, but by and large, these were, not, these were not gods that you loved. These were not gods you asked to love you. In fact, the more, by and large, they ignored you, the safer you were. And, and as before, many times I've used the analogy of a playground bully. Well, you know, you can be the kid who coughs up his lunch money. You can be the henchman who works for the bully. That doesn't mean he respects you. It just means you're a useful tool right now, but he'll sell you out in a second. These would be the priests of the pagan world who got really close to the gods and often ended up castrated or sacrificed or whatever. And, and, and all of this, we're, we're talking about all this in order to set it over against what we find in the life of Abraham, or Abram as he first was, because scripture calls him the friend of God. Hmm. And we can think of, was it St. Teresa who says that's, or Jesus says to St. Teresa, that's how I treat my friends. Yes, Lord, that's why you don't have very many. But... <laughs> God's God's friendship is not the chummy friendship of he's there to make us happy. It's not therapeutic deism. But it is a real, burning, deep, powerful love that took Jesus to the cross. And that's the kind of friendship we want to talk about tonight, particularly from um, the book of Galatians. And cha- I'm in chapter 3. Chapter 3, uh, Genesis of uh, Galatians, there we go, Galatians, uh, is in many ways a commentary on the book of Genesis, and particularly on the life of Abram. And uh, we, we see the Paul using the life of Abram to answer the Galatian heresy in, in Galatia, which was Gentile territory. Paul had gone and preached the gospel with great success, and people were very happy about this, this gospel of freedom, of being God's friend by faith alone, through Christ alone, by grace alone. But after Paul left, some people came along, um, Judaizers, we call them, who said something along the lines of, um, how'd you come to Jesus? Oh, Paul. Oh, yeah. Uh, hmm. Yeah, Paul's a really great guy. We've, 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 we've met him. You know, he, he, uh, he, he's really good on justification. I bet he told you about coming to, to Jesus by faith. He did. Yeah, that's great. Did he, did he talk about circumcision at all? And, and about the blessing of the Holy Spirit and how to, to advance in the Christian life and become more mature as a, no circumcision. Oh, you know, that's just like Paul. You know, he wasn't one of the 12. He didn't really walk with Jesus. But we've hung out with the real apostles. Let us tell you how to become a really super Christian. You believe in Jesus and then. Mm-hmm. And in the and them for them was circumcision. And God uses extreme examples oftentimes in scripture to make his point. And here, what better example than something he actually at one point had ordained. Abraham was indeed circumcised. But he was circumcised after he believed the promise, after God covenanted with him, after he received the Spirit. So with that in mind, let me read from Galatians chapter 3. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth crucified among you. This only would I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law, 
or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit? Are you now made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if it yet be in vain? He therefore that ministereth you the Spirit, and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And this is from the earlier part of uh, Genesis 15, uh, 15, 6. Know you, therefore, that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it's written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it's evident, for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it's written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on the tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Uh, and the word I would like to focus on here, for starters, is the word blessed. If you are of faith, then you're blessed with faithful Abraham. In thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. In thee shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. And so let's talk about the word blessing, what it means and what it doesn't mean, and any perversions you've heard of. I was so blessed today. I got my socks <laughs> blessed off. Anything come to <laughs> it's my generation. Anything come to mind? I remember my grandfather teaching on Psalm 1 where it says, blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, mm -hmm. and so on. And his interpretation was, blessed here means happy. Happy is the man that does this and does not do that and does this. I'm, I'm not a Hebrew scholar, so I don't know if that <laughs> has any correlation, but that's the first thing that I think of. Well, Jesus said, blessed are you when men shall uh, persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. There may be those rare spiritual souls who can sing hallelujah while the uh, red hot pokers are being shoved into their eyes. I don't think I would be one of them. <laughs> it seems to me that there are some things that the Bible describes as a blessed state that isn't what we as 21st century North Americans would think of as particularly happy. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to tweak one side or the other. We can either say that there's more to happiness than feeling good at the moment. All right, well, that, that's fair enough. There, you, you could go that direction. Or we could say that blessing is more than and other than, in some ways, feeling happy, elated, pleased with life at the moment. Mm -hmm. What Jesus is saying in the, in the Sermon on the Mount, what the psalmist is saying, is that you have God's favor. God means you infinitely well. It will be well with you. All will be well and all will be well and all manner of things will be well in God's providence, by God's predestination through Jesus, uh, and that even though it may hurt a lot, be very sorrowful, really sorrowful, now God means it for your good. And we can think here of, of Romans 8, these things that work for us in exceeding an eternal weight of glory. To suffer for Jesus is a most blessed thing. And if in that you can find happiness, then then it then happiness is a good equivalent but if at the time you just all you can think of is uh lord this hurts a lot can it go away now, now, most americans at least in our in our generation would not think that that's happy i think they would want a different word there just uh, a slight correction the weight of glory is second corinthians 4 is it romans indeed 8. uh what's romans 8 romans yeah. 8 the other one all things working together for good yeah i think there's something just before that but you are right of course about um about the weight of glory. I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So similar passage, we sure write Second Corinthians, uh, weight of glory. And, and here we can point to Lewis's book, The Weight of Glory, <laughs> as something that would be a good corrective or instruction with regard to 
the nature of happiness and, uh, and, and, and blessedness. And we'll link to that in the show notes. And there will be a link, no doubt. Well, as we, um, as we look at Galatians, Paul speaks of two things that are intimately related. First of all, uh, this, uh, he, he does use the, the original promise to Abraham get you from your family, from your land, I'll, to a place that I'll show you. I'll make of you a, a great nation. And in you and in your seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed, or later all the nations of the earth be blessed. And Paul in Galatians says, the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preach the gospel before unto Abraham, saying, in thee shall all nations be blessed. Uh, that promise to Abraham was not, come along on, on the ride, and I'm going to take you to a really special land, and you're going to be really special, and you're going to be really happy, and all the nations are going to be happy. Again, if you want to define that very carefully, that'll work. But Paul says this is, this is the gospel. He preached the gospel to Abraham. Blessing is what the gospel brings. This is so we need to stop and say, well, what does the gospel bring us? They which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. The alternative to blessing, as as many as are of the works of the law under the curse, but that no man's justified by the law on the side of God, it's evident the just shall live by faith. And then Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Verse 14, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So he started way back in verse 6, with Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, and he ends up with, and those who believe will also then be justified by faith and receive the promise of the Holy Spirit. So here are two things we can talk about then, and um, we, we can assume that in our audience there will be people who've heard this a million times, and that there will be people who have never really heard it at all. So let's do uh, what we can with it for both this this blessing of being made right with God by faith, and the twin blessing that's tied and wrapped up in it, the promise, the gift of the Holy Spirit, both received by faith. So we can talk about justification, or we can talk about the gift of the Spirit, and in both cases we can talk, as Paul had to, about this faith alone thing. Why is that so important? Why can't it be faith plus something else? Why can't we tell people if they really want to be holy, if they really want to be spiritual, if they want to take their Christianity to the next level, well, yeah, you start with Jesus, and you start with believing him or accepting him, or receiving him, whatever. But then you have to fill in the blank. So I'm going to turn it back to you. What comes to mind out of your own experience, your own reading, along any of these lines? Well, uh, definitely in, in recent years, there's been a resurgence in a type of theology that it, it, its basis is in collapsing or denying the distinction between a covenant of works and a covenant of grace. Oh, mm. yeah, good one. And essentially what happens when you, when you do that is you don't have grace anymore. You have gospel a mixture of <laughs> gospel like and that. law i don't remember mm. who i heard that from but it's it's a perfect term and no no more is justification or or even sanctification something monergistically done mm. it's something that you have to supply your own part to and yes. you know if you really want to be spiritual you should also do this and it, the this can be anything yeah. in these particular in the ones that i'm going to vaguely reference it we can name it that's fine <laughs> that's fine in the federal vision <laughs> it can be anything from you need to advocate for theonomy in order mm -hmm. to be you know to to be fully saved more or less or you need to, or to experience the fullness of the blessing exactly whatever yeah. form it may take whatever form it is or you need to be be married hmm. if you want to understand the fullness of the gospel transforming the world and culture and, and any other number of things that they want to transform you should get married <laughs> and have children and that's the way that you really build the kingdom in a substantive way yeah and 
you know, as a single guy, that 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 hurts a little bit too. <laughs> and or it when flies I was single, in the face I should of say. Paul's message to you, a single guy, that if you're single, praise the Lord that you're single. You know, <laughs> exactly. Uh, and, and it's not that any of these things, in and of themselves, is unbiblical or bad advice. Be fruitful, multiply, or finish the earth. But what happens is if, and if you don't do this, you will be a second-rate Christian. There are things you will not understand, blessings you will not have. There's something that Jesus didn't buy for you mm. because you haven't done this. And, and uh, you, don't even, doesn't matter. you don't even need to go into the FV camp to, yeah. to see right. people saying that about marriage. I mean, that that is mm -hmm. in the air of evangelicalism even. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Although there's there's a counter problem where they're basically <laughs> saying you don't have to get married at all. Like no one <laughs> needs to get married. <laughs> you end up with the the opposite ditch. Well, we usually do. We usually do have the opposite ditches mm -hmm. um, because Satan lays traps on both sides of the road. Oh, Let's yes. go over here. Oh, wait, look at this horrible trap. We'll run as far <laughs> as we can in the other direction to escape it and not notice that we just stumbled into the opposite trap. Yeah, and we'll we'll be pointing fingers back and forth across the road at the people in the other in the other trap, uh, condemning them for their legalism mm -hmm. and missing our own. There's clearly discretion to be had, obviously, because there there are things that you naturally should move to the complete opposite of. For example, if mm -hmm. the previous error you held was Jesus isn't God, the solution <laughs> is not to find the middle ground between Jesus is God and Jesus isn't God. Oh, Jesus is kind of God. That's semi-Arianism, <laughs> and we don't want that. <laughs> well, no, the, the other Jesus isn't God. Jesus is only God. He's not man. Exactly. Yeah. Um, well, that, there, that's the That's opposite the real extreme. opposite error. That's yeah. true, I guess. But no, I know what you, I know what you mean. There yeah, are some you truths know. that are absolute, and, and yes, we don't want to leave them behind. But in the process of fleeing one heresy, we don't want to see what ultimately is a complementary heresy as mm -hmm. our as our salvation. We need to stop and listen to what the Bible actually says, rather than having this knee jerk reaction yeah. to things. And speaking again, as those in the Reformed Presbyterian tradition, there's some things in our past that we've <laughs> run away from because that's what Rome does. Mm. Well, yeah. it, it may or may not be a good idea, but because Rome did it is not a sufficient reason in and of itself not to do it. Uh, there, yeah. there may be times and places where not being like Rome might be a good idea and certainly might at one point have been a good idea, but that's not scripture. You can think of things like uh, divine simplicity. Yeah. There's... People in Reformed Presbyterianism who functionally deny it, even yeah. though they might claim the terms, they're arguing against it, and more or less the argument boils down to, well, we don't, we won't, we don't want that because that's what Rome does, and we want to, yeah. we want to use Scripture's terminology. That's another thing. I'm sorry, apparently I'm banging the the FV horn but, <laughs> or a drum, but um, that that's one of the problems in that camp is is that they're they're very strong on wanting to use the language of scripture and yes. so they'll they'll use they'll try to say we're using scripture's language but the problem is that they're denying parts of scripture because scripture uses the same term in different senses in different right. areas mm -hmm. right. and yeah. so they yeah. try to find some synthesis of the terminology that ends up denying what theologians have defined those things as from a holistic uh cohesive yeah. view of scripture as it speaks to those mm -hmm. uh concepts yeah. Mm. And I think I've mentioned this before, but that's the very strategy that the Unitarians mm. used when they were combating, well, Orthodox Trinitarianism is they, they removed all references to the Trinity in their liturgy and replaced it with whatever Bible verses they want to say, hey, we've got more straight up Bible in our liturgy than you do in yours because you've added all this other stuff. Oh. I, when I was a teenager, I met a Jehovah's Witness lady at the door and I you, know, you you could tell. It was easy in those days. Uh, and uh, she wanted to talk. And I said, wait, wait, wait. Bef before we go anywhere, the thing we're going to divide on is who Jesus is. Tell me, who is Jesus Christ? And she said something along the lines of, well, he's the son of God. He's the word of God. He's the express image of the Father, the brightness of the Father's glory. He's wonderful. He's counselor. And she kept piling scripture on scripture until I blew the whistle and said, wait, stop. Is he Jehovah? Oh, no. Okay, thank you. <laughs> now we're being honest. Yeah, she appealed to scripture, torn out of context, undefined, unexplained, unexposited, 
and thought that that was a sufficient answer. It was, in yeah. fact, simply a blind. And from the days of Arius forward, yeah, that's exactly the way of the heretics is to pick up the language of Scripture, but pour their own meaning into it. Mm -hmm. yes. And those who write creeds are accused, as you say, of, well, you're, you're using man's words. We just want to use the Bible. Yeah. Wait, you just spoke to us using man's words. By your own <laughs> definition, then we should ignore anything you just said. Blah, 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 blah. I can't hear you. <laughs> There's a relevant quote here, uh -huh. because one of the things that... As, refor as Reformed people, we we have our own Reformed tradition, and mm -hmm. we would say, you know, obviously Calvin pulled heavily from the Church Fathers whenever sure. he wrote anything. It's a Catholic, in the proper sense, doctrine. Right. It's a universal doctrine. And I was reading in, I actually took a picture of it because I didn't want to forget it <laughs> uh, by the time the morning came around from the Creedal Imperative, which I recommended last week or Monday, whatever time I Whenever actually recommended we did, it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he says, you know, Paul's gospel is truly traditional. It has a stable content and it is passed on from generation to generation. Indeed, for Paul, the fact that something was not taught in the past and not passed on as a tradition would presumably have dramatically increased the chances that it was false. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. So to clarify, you may be thinking, dear listener, have they just put Federal Vision on the same level as Jehovah's Witnesses? <laughs> and the answer to that, in a very specific sense, is yes, we have. Because in both cases, there's something beyond Jesus' atoning work, his righteousness imputed to us, that we have to rest on. And yeah. if anyone who claims the title Federal Vision is saying with horror, no, we don't believe that, all right, well, then that's good. Please tell all of those around you that you don't believe that. Mm -hmm. And send us an email to yeah. tell us. Yes. Um, <laughs> and I, I, I do not doubt for a moment that there are people who, who, who claim the title Federal Vision, or at least played footsies in that camp for a while, who do believe that, that salvation is through Christ and Christ alone. And okay, but you, you you need to say that, and you need to say it out loud, and you need to say it in a way that everyone around you understands, because there are very clearly people who bear that name who don't believe that, or there are people who don't understand that the way they're talking says they don't believe that. Right. Their, their language betrays them, and if they were mm. to be tried purely on the basis of what they have said or written, they would be convicted in court. You can say, well, but but they didn't mean that. We didn't mean that. Yeah. So don't Let's, say that. <laughs> don't, don't think before you say things, yeah. especially before you put them in cyberspace. Cyberspace is for eternity. People can, can hunt them down and find those words and bring them back to you and say, look, this is what you said. And, and I, I know out of my own experience that sometimes you, you, you can read people. I, there were some people involved with the Federal Vision who very early on I read with some appreciation and then after the whole thing kind of got rolling and I saw where it was going, I went back and read the things that I appreciated. And some of them were still pretty good. And some of them weren't because mm -hmm. now I saw with new eyes. I saw what they were really saying. Instead of reading it out of out of my perspective, I was seeing more clearly what their perspective was and reading it in terms of that. And suddenly it wasn't so good anymore. Yeah. So we're, we're, we're raising the creedal confessional challenge. Can you affirm justification by faith? as it's presented in any of the reform standards, without quibbling, without redefining, and with great joy. And if you can, then no, you're not like a Jehovah's Witness. <laughs> but if you're cringing or wiggling right now, then you maybe need to talk to God about this one. And we do not treat these things lightly, nor mm -hmm. is it our business to excommunicate anybody. Mm -hmm. But we do... We're four right. people on a podcast. We're, we're yeah. not a church council. <laughs> we're or not a church council. Three. But to we the, do. To we... the listener's perception, there are three of us because David doesn't talk. <laughs> yes, sir. Sorry. But, but he makes interesting <laughs> facial grimaces now and then and, and, and smiles happily upon his uh, his wife. Uh, so now we, we, we appeal to the councils, the confessions of the church Catholic, uh, which we think are in most cases are pretty clear. And we would just wish that anybody else who wishes to speak publicly in the name of Christ would also be clear and and think before they speak. Um, but leaving the federal vision behind and and other things, Brian, I was 
thinking that maybe out of a certain other tradition that you come from and are familiar with, you might also have run into. I can I can see his face right now. Oh no! Um, <laughs> <laughs> now, if you don't want to, that's fine. I can. I no. I experiences. well uh, for the reader's benefit. Um, <laughs> I was raised as a word of faith Pentecostal, which um, always causes people some confusion if they don't know me and they hear that and they're like, "But you're." A Presbyterian? How did that like, happen? As Presbyterian as it is possible to be. <laughs> I, I don't know. I think there's a couple steps more of, extre- of extremeness. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's it's worlds apart. And what you find in that camp is a resting... Now, I don't... I have to be very careful here because... And we want to be careful. And I would say this, just like Greg gave his... Um, uh, clarification uh, regarding folks who claim the title of uh, federal visionists is if you actually claim and acknowledge that Christ's merit is the only basis for your salvation, that's a good thing. Mm-hmm. The problem is, is that in practice, that doesn't really get taught as the basis. Mm-hmm. And hear, hearing some some sermons from word of faith types there's a lot of law and you know you need to do this and you should do that and there's not a whole lot of christ preached except at the very very end when they follow finney's footsteps and give an altar call Mm -hmm. now i luckily enough the church that i was raised in did not teach the following but you will find in some pentecostal circles that you are not actually saved if you do not speak in tongues. There are some who claim that this is the evidence of the infilling of the Holy Spirit in a salvific sense, and that if you do not demonstrate it, you do not have the infilling of the Spirit in a salvific sense. That is Hmm. absolute poppycock. That is against everything that we are taught in Scripture. The only basis for salvation is the meritorious work of Christ, both in his life and his ministry, and also of his sanctifying and atoning death on the cross those are the that is the only basis for our salvation but that is that is what you find in these camps and really what we want to be combating is the teaching it's not necessarily yes. the people it's the Correct. teaching um well, well there's some people i want they... to combat <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is yeah, tempting tempting there are a great many dear believers who believe what they believe because they've always believed it because they've always been taught it by people they respected from their mm-hmm. pastors mm-hmm. and their parents. And for such, we simply want to help and say, have you thought about this? Have you seen this passage of scripture? Have you compared what you're believing and what you're saying with what the Bible says here and there? And no, we don't want to be combative and we don't want to accuse them of horrible sins. Mm-hmm. Uh, we all have our weak spirits spots or blind spots, things that we believe because we've been taught. Uh, We don't know better. Uh, But those pastors and teachers who do know better, who have every reason to know better, who have been confronted by sound theologians have been told, this is heresy, and they go on misleading their flock, that's a very dangerous place to be. Paul, in um, writing to the Galatians, is very kind. He's, He's straight up. It's tough love. But he continues to speak of them as saints, as people he he loves and who have loved him in the past, of uh, being persuaded that, that they have not fallen yet. But when he comes to talk of these false teachers, he says, I would, they were even cut off. And in the context, it means castrated. Uh, he's not mild in his shepherd's defense of the flock. And uh, we we are concerned, yes, with the false doctrines. And in some cases, with the people who seem to deliberately spout them, there was a, a video that uh, it, it starts by introducing what the gospel justification by faith really is, and then it takes us to Word of Faith Ministries and gives us clips. From oh yes, I actually David. showed this to David years ago. Um, it's but it's from Justin Peters Ministry, and I can't remember the name of it, but he's put out several like that. Well, we will oh, wait, no, no, actually, I'm so notes. sorry. No, this oh, was more recent. It? It'd be worth, really be worth recommending this. This okay. is excellent. Because the first half is basically, here's the gospel and here's how you teach it. Here's how you preach it. Here's mm-hmm. how you do not turn scripture into moralism. 
But then the second half is straight up clips from existing ministries showing exactly what they say. Mm -hmm. And it's horrible. It's, yeah. it's here are people who are leading their flocks to hell and, and, uh, and not just the kind of stuff we're talking about. It goes way beyond that. Mm -hmm. uh, so it would be good if we could recommend it. It is called yeah. American Gospel Christ That's Alone. It. Oh, That's it. Oh, the whole full length documentary. Yes. yes. Oh, okay. I thought you, you were know. talking about like a short little YouTube thing. Oh, no. <laughs> but we can totally recommend American Gospel. Absolutely. I actually have yet to watch it, but I've heard nothing but. I, I haven't good watched things. it either. There, there comes a point where um, you can't watch it ever again. <laughs> stuff. PTSD. Uh, it's the first half is a description of the gospel of justification by faith and explanations by sound Bible teachers from various denominations. Uh, on how you go about teaching from both the Old and the New Testament without lapsing into moralism and making Christ central. Uh, the mm -hmm. second part is cl largely clips from existing ministries who don't do that, who try to throw people back on their own efforts and their own merits, uh, and in the process grant them, as it were, power over the Spirit himself, power over God, magical powers. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's it's and, and it's frightening because it's real. I mean, these are these are people people whose names we would know, and we have the words out of their own mouths on tape. And it, it's something, if you got the stomach for it, you really, really should see. It'll be, the first part's certainly a blessing, the second part's kind of a shock. So American uh, Gospel, yeah. and uh, Emily will give you more information in the uh, show notes. Yeah, we'll put a link there. Um, I think it's on Amazon Prime if you have that. James says, that not many of you should become teachers because those who teach will be judged more strictly. Yeah. I think that's a great warning to any of us with a platform, but especially to those whose job is to preach the gospel, mm -hmm. whose job is to hold forth Christ. So that's sobering, but also encouraging is that there's nothing else that we need but Christ. But Christ yeah. himself. Mm -hmm. And that's what Paul's saying here in Galatians. We, he he points us to Christ as the source of our justification, as our righteousness, our legal standing before God. And and for those, if, if there are those who've never really heard the gospel or don't understand what we're talking about because they've never heard the gospel in these terms, the doctrine of justification by faith is very simply this. Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, became true man, covenant representative. He went to the cross. God imputed to him, legally transferred to him, credited to him, all the sins of his people, all those for whom he died. And when we come to Christ in faith, he credits to us Jesus' perfect law-keeping, his obedience, his righteousness, his full obedience to the Father. So that when God looks at us, he sees the righteousness, indeed he sees the person of his Son, because we are in Jesus. And we receive this by faith and faith alone. There's nothing we can add to that, not our tears, not our yearnings, not our hunches, not our works, not our penance, not our obediences piled up on top of one another, not our monies, our offerings, our gifts, our spiritual gifts, not the working of miracles, nothing but simply trusting Jesus alone. Uh, this is the answer to man's real guilt problem. It's in Jesus. It's acknowledging that we can do nothing except receive God's free gift offered in Jesus Christ. That's justification by faith. If you've never heard this before, then God is calling to you to hear and believe and receive Jesus as the full answer to all of your salvation, to all, all that you need for your salvation. Now, but the second thing is, and it is the second thing, the promise of the Spirit. God who justifies us freely communicates to us his Holy Spirit through Christ to change us, to write his law in our hearts, to give us a new nature, to give us new birth, to give us eternal life, to sanctify us so that we're not the same people anymore. We're united to Jesus in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And that new life begins flowing through us and in us and makes us different people. Not in order to earn anything, not in order to make God as judge any more happy than he already is, any more reconciled than he already is, any more propitiated than he already is, but so that we can indeed be, in the most intimate practical sense, the friend of God from our side. He's already befriended us. He gave us his son. Now we get to enjoy that friendship as the Holy Spirit continues to work transformation in our hearts. The standard of that transformation is the law of God, the whole word of God as it comes to us as truth and law. 
but it's not something, it's not a checklist whereby we work to earn more brownie points, more blessings, more favors. It's simply, we get to know God better. We get to be the kind of people he wants us to be. And we get to enjoy this friendship with Jesus more than we would otherwise. And in, if you want to call that a blessing, so be it. But it's a blessing that God's working in us. He works in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. It is not something that rises autonomously out of our flesh, which is the whole point of, of Galatians. The flesh offers nothing. That which is one of the flesh is flesh. We need to be born again. We need the Spirit of God, and the Spirit of God comes by faith in Jesus. You want more of the Holy Spirit? Then trust in Jesus. You need more of the Spirit? Listen to the gospel. It points you to Jesus. The gospel will bring forth the fruit of the Spirit in your life. And that's why as we get to the end of Galatians, we come to the fruit of the Spirit. Well, how do you get that? By believing the gospel, by believing in Jesus, trusting Jesus. Amen. Amen to that. And even the my my pastor uh, actually just gave a sermon. I want to say it was this year, but honestly, everything has kind of squished together in my mind. <laughs> uh, it could have been last year on the armor of God. Oh, yes. And how it's often turned into a checklist of things that you have to put mm -hmm. on every morning right. or something like that. When in reality, and again, it's been a few months since I listened to this particular show, and I could be misremembering some of it. He essentially is, he drew out from this text that this is just about believing the gospel. Yes. You, you have peace with God and you are gifted faith and righteousness like these are all things that are given to you they're not things you right. have to put on yeah if you don't charge you up our on... power cells <laughs> exactly <laughs> if you have to put on your own helmet of salvation every morning that means you misplaced it during the night and that's <laughs> disconcerting yes indeed can you find that sermon and send us the link to put in the show notes absolutely in fact i will look for awesome. it right now fabulous with that, we must transition to recos because we are running out of time. Greg, do you have something to recommend? We'll give you American Gospel for free, so you can have another one. <laughs> I now I, I I think that's my recommendation. If everyone would go uh, listen to that, I would be very very happy. Besides, I always do books, so <laughs> yay me! It's <laughs> branching out. <laughs> yay. There's also there's two parts of that. There's I forget the subtitles, but there are two and they have different subtitles and they are different films, but both on the same theme. Marvelous. Um, yeah, we'll, we will link them both. Brian, do you have a recommendation? I do. I'm going to recommend uh, actually five books or Whoa. tomes. Five books? Depending I didn't upon... say you could have five recos. Well, uh, Who do it you is think by you are? it's by technicality. Uh, <laughs> it, that, that is the name of it, although the books, quote unquote, are much shorter. Uh, compared to uh, novels or even novellas. Uh, but I'm going to recommend the Church Father Cyril of Alexandria's Five Tomes Against Nestorius, Ooh. which is a fantastic <laughs> book. Um, it's available for free online at tertullian.org. Hey. Uh, but if you just Google Five Tomes Against uh, Nestorius, you'll be able to find it for, fairly simple. There we'll is also a, link it in the show notes. I will also link it in the show notes. Um, mm -hmm. There is a marvelous section. I wanted to read part of it because the church fathers just knew not to hold back when oh, they yeah. were arguing <laughs> with heretics. So spicy. So and spicy. it was so great. <laughs> so he quotes something out of Nestorius's writings first, wherein uh, Nestorius attacking the title Theotokos or mm -hmm. um, God-bearer for uh, the Virgin Mary basically says, well, I, I understand, I agree that Christ passed through Mary, and that's perfectly fine. That's what the scriptures say. He's like, but I've not, I have not said passed through in the sense of born, for not so quickly <laughs> do I forget my own words. And in his response, um, Cyril of Alexandria says, Herein, therefore, he styles heretic him who upholds the right and admirable faith about Christ, and who, since he is truly God, calls her mother of God who bear him. But there will be no doubt to any of those who think aright that it is himself who, fastening the blame of heresies on them who choose to deem aright, is establishing the unbeauty of his own words, and has all but confessed openly that he is being born outside of the straight way and is making crooked paths. In other words... <laughs> 
you're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but he says it with so many words. <laughs> yeah, yes, he does. That, not going to lie. I thought that was a little bit hard to follow. <laughs> I, I usually read with a pencil because I have to go back and <laughs> see it. I'm not an audiobook person. That's but. fair. Anyway, that is my recommendation. Cyril of Alexandria, Five Tones Against the Stories. Very Solid. Nice. Thank you. And Emily? I am going to recommend the book Finish by John A. Cuff. I think that's how you say his name. A Cuff, like a cuff link, but just a cuff. He wrote a book called Stuff Christians Like, which was funny. <laughs> um, I read excerpts of it. So he's a very humor humorous writer. But this book Finish is about perfectionism mm. and why it's dumb and why you shouldn't listen to it and how to get over it. And that's Marvelous. something I struggle with. So I enjoyed reading this book and it was very inspiring. And also fits into this category because perfectionism. Mm. Trust Jesus and keep this long list so that, oh, well, yeah. you know, you know, yeah, those people, I, I believe this was one of your lines. Well, that's all right for them to be like that, but I hold myself <laughs> to a higher standard. Right. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, on that happy note. On that happy note. <laughs> I can end it on a happier note. Okay. okay, let's be happier. Uh, this is a, sub a subordinate blessed. recommendation. Go find, if you have Spotify, you should go find, or we can link to it. There's a playlist <laughs> with German versions of English songs, including, <laughs> including my personal favorite of them, a German version sung by ABBA of Waterloo. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> I am a German language geek, so uh, this is a thing that someone sent to me and said, you should know about this. And I, they were right. I should have known about this. All right. <laughs> well, that exists. We will link exists. to it. You can send us an email at haltingtowardsion at gmail.com with your recommendations. What have you been reading? What should we read? Thank you guys so much for being here and contributing to this conversation, making this happen. I really appreciate it. Thanks also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. Thanks to our supporters and our listeners. If you would, are a listener and would like to be a supporter, you can do that by going to our Anchor homepage, anchor.fm slash halting towards Zion, if you want to give a recurring monthly gift. Or you can visit our PayPal for a one-time gift. That's paypal.me slash halting towards Zion. And another way that you can support us is by buying books through our show notes. If you click on the Amazon links, not all of our show notes are things to buy. And if there's a free version of what we're talking about that's really good, I'll link that instead. But if there's something to buy and you bought it, we'd get a little, a little kickback from that. So you can buy through our affiliate links if you want. Um, you can like our Facebook page. We have show notes and transcripts. We've talked a lot about show notes. Leave us a review. Follow me on Goodreads. Thank you very much. See you next time. Bye.